Thank you, Mr. Chairman. 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 Thank you, Mr. Ch
but you do have criminal penalties in case there is an um, issue of a repeat violation because you could definitely demonstrate that someone had the intent to violate the code if this is the second time you've done it and you've prosecuted them in the prior um, occurrence. So that's included and also the penalties for subdivision violations. What I would like to hear from you tonight is the um, amount that you'd like to set as a civil penalty. Um, I've seen some cities, this is on page 10, some cities have set it as low as $50 and as high as $500. You can have this as a one-time violation. We can also uh, make it a penalty that is imposed every day. We have some recent case law that says you can't just issue one notice of violation and then if the violation goes on for two months before it's actually appealed and you start prosecution, that it's um, automatically imposed every single day. There's another procedure that you have to uh, follow. But this could be a one-time penalty. It could also be a penalty every day for every day that the violation is in existence. So some cities like to set it high because then you're going to force the person to come in and try and uh, uh, gain compliance. Normally if they do come in and they fix the problem, we just waive the penalty. If they refuse, then what the planning director or planner will do is send the case to me and then I will start the um, uh, process in, you know, in court if there's no appeal. And then we'll do an enforcement action to get penalties and also to enforce the code. So, that's where we are. Any questions? Yeah. Yeah, I have two questions. One is on uh, the appeal, we discussed it last week, that's why I came back to the workshop, oh, okay. is you're only allowing 15 calendar days versus 15 business days. Uh -huh. Is there a reason for that or can that be changed? You can definitely change that. Okay. And then my second question is, is for some of the more minor infractions, why would we force people to appeal to a hearing examiner when they have to pay for the hearing examiner, which is quite a chunk of money for some small? versus just one court saying I disagree with the way it's being interpreted and the example I have is our RD ordinance instead of going to let the judge decide whether our ordinance is proper or not. And I realize we have stuff in our zoning code designed you know, for applying the zoning, but we have things in there that don't probably belong in there. And until that's fixed, I don't think people should be forced to appeal to a hearing examiner versus just one of the judge. Okay, well, um, as to things in your code that you don't think, um, that you think needs to be fixed, um, you don't have to enforce those code provisions. There's nothing that requires you to enforce every single section of your code. So that would be the solution rather than to but reduce... But as council, we don't get to decide that, the mayor and her staff does. Okay, but um, just as a policy matter, it seems that the council could weigh in on that issue with the mayor, um, but what I, I guess what I can say is whenever you appeal something to the hearing examiner, um, you are going to incur some costs. And I don't recommend that you, you know, I'm, I'm just kind of confused here. What exactly do you want to do? Is you, do you want to present an appeal? Or no. not allow an appeal? Or? No, I, I just, on some issues, I don't understand why we have to go to a, a notice of violation versus a, uh, an infraction, or a infraction goes to the court versus... Oh, okay. So you want to know why don't we have that other procedure? Yes. Well, you can do that if you want. I don't recommend using that other procedure. And the reason is you go through the municipal court process and then the appeal is also to the municipal court and then you have another step in the court system beyond that to appeal. So there's an extra step there that someone has to follow. If you want to use the civil infraction process, we need a different ordinance. The reason why I suggested this process is this is the process that I'm familiar with, this is the process that works, and on top of that, I'm in the business of gaining compliance. And if you have a process like this, and people know that if they get a notice of violation, their option is either to comply or appeal to the hearing examiner, you're going to get compliance. And that's what I'm interested in. Now, if, if you think there are provisions in your code that shouldn't be enforced, 
um, that's a different issue. But I really think that this process works to gain code compliance. And I think that's what the but city should be interested in. Right, but it only allows justice to those who afford it if they feel that the way the code is being enforced is wrong. Well, they have no, no ability to appeal if they can't afford the $2,000. So it's $2,000 for hearing That's what Gary told me. I'm not sure if it is or not. He, he brought that up. If it's $1,000, I mean, um, just to be able to have your voice heard. And if you win, you don't get that money back. Well, uh, one option is, is to also look at those costs and determine whether or not there's something that the city wants to pay with regard to that. Because some cities have lower fees to go to hearing examiners. And this became an issue in a lawsuit I had recently where the appeal to the hearing examiner uh, required the appellant to take all of the hearing examiner's costs and all of the staff time associated with that. And it came to almost $12,000. And there was an appeal, and looking at that in light of recent case law, my recommendation was that they need to reduce their fee and make the hearing examiner's appeal more accessible. But in order to do that, you look at your actual cost, how much you want to absorb, because you're never going to be able to recover all the hearing examiner's cost. I think that city that did that was wrong, and we recommended that that fee come down. But you do have to still have an administrative fee, otherwise people will appeal to the hearing examiner, you know, even though they have no basis for an appeal. Um, another option that you could decide to do is, um, with the hearing examiner process, you could say that if you appeal to the hearing examiner and you lose, then you have to pay the fee. I mean, there's options with regard to that. Yeah. Is there an alternative to have a, uh sliding scale on the fee or a fee that can be waived if the person can demonstrate that it's unreasonable for them to pay it. And that's done in other instances. And we have some sort of you know, financial hardship, you don't have to pay the fee, but if, you know, if you're a major developer, yeah, you're going to come in and you're going to pay the full fee. It's not any, you know, we're not going to subsidize that, but if you're an individual homeowner who's on a limited income. Yes, that's definitely something that you can do. I don't like the idea of limiting the fee for everybody when some of these appeals really do have tens of thousands of dollars of cost uh, for the city and if the city ends up prevailing, why shouldn't we pay for that? Right, and you could also, by not having a fee, for having a very, very low fee, you could encourage appeals. So, that, the, the amendment you guys are talking about with regard to the fee, that would not be to this ordinance. Because this ordinance doesn't impose the fee for the right. appeal.
attuned to resolving land use conflicts, I believe, in going to municipal court. And if you go to municipal court and the prosecutor is representing it, then there's also an issue of whether or not you're going to get the results that you would get um, with me because land use is all I do. Right. And I know land use is really important to a lot of cities. You want to be sure that your city looks the way you want it to look. Another issue is, you know, on page 7, there's this mediation process. And we could also build into the process um, more of a, a notice that um, goes out to the landowner as a warning. Some cities like to have a separate procedure put in here. Um, it would be like on page 3 where um, instead of, well actually it's in there, notice of correction. So you send out a notice of correction that you're basically telling the person this is a warning. And if you don't fix this, then you're going to end up in a notice of violation. <coughs> well, you know, if you really think that there's a possibility that we could end up in a situation where people can't appeal or they cost them too much money, we put another step in there that says the city attorney will review every notice of correction that, uh, where the property owner requests it or something like that. And then I could take a look at it and make sure that we're not going after something at the, you know, local level that I don't know about, uh, you know, unnecessarily. Yeah, I mean, I agree with every aspect of it because I think a lot of zoning, especially Chapter 20, is how we develop our property in, in the city and how developers are supposed to to comply with the codes that are out there that we adopt and uh, and our adoption of the national or international building code and, and that stuff. It's just when, it, when we have stuff in there that affects the ordinary user of their property after it's been developed, that's where it gets into that, that area that I think we, we create a problem where we can create inac inaccessibility to the system. And, and that's my concern. If you're saying we can fix that, that's what I would like to see. Would you, you want uh, another section here that says it goes to the city attorney before a notice violation issues or something like that? I'd be fine with that. Uh, I'm wondering if we have any past guide, guidelines um, how often a notice of correction uh, gets the field out and somebody saying, oh, yeah, you're right. You're not staff here tonight for that, but I was wondering what fraction of notice of correction would you actually end up having to look at? Well, I can tell you that um, I used to do code enforcement for the city of Seattle. And that was like from 1984 until 1989. So that was a long time ago. But um, there was a very, very small fraction that were ever appealed. What normally happens is the notice of violation would go out, and then the property owner would ignore it. They just ignore it. And then um, a letter would go out to them from the city attorney's office saying, you haven't complied with this. Now we're going to take this to court and we're going to enforce it for penalties and to gain compliance unless you do something. And that's when all of a sudden you get a phone call and they say, oh, you know what, I, I really need to do something about it, I'm going to take care of it. And then I would say, okay, you have so many days to take care of it, if you don't do it by then, I'm going to file the complaint in the Superior Court. Very few people appeal. They just ignore it, thinking it's going to go away. And that's when, you know, like I say, you just send out the letter saying, okay, here's the consequences, I'm going for it. Basically, I think we've got to talk about it. I mean, I think we need to probably first check with our building official, but I don't recall that this ever coming up and being a huge uh, abundance of people filing appeals or, or threatening to file appeals, whatever it is. We have yeah, just very few. I know there's been one specific developer in town that everything he did was wrong. And, uh, but normally, the, even the individuals, they come down, as long as they can get straight answers at City Hall and they can comply or whatever. That's where I've said in the past, we need a, a little brochure put together or something so when they come in and ask, Okay, I got a lot that I want to develop a house in behind me. What what are my steps? They can give it to them in writing, and because a lot of times it's 
it's just a misinterpretation. And I, I don't see any reason to spend a whole bunch of money and time and, and reworking these appeals. We can't handle them on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, but I don't think it's ever been an issue. At this point, I, don't, I, I personally don't think that we need to uh, deal with too many of the concerns about uh, core case cases of this. I think with the fact that we allow them, we give them notification in advance, and it gives them a time to come in and deal with it, you know, before they go through it. You know, you get the, now, you're, now you're getting to the point where you've got five days and you know, so it's Give them enough advance knowledge you know, to deal with this without having them at that point to even worry about a hearing uh, examiner cost. And I think we need to look at the cost. We can just talk about it, but I haven't actually seen the cost of hearing examiner. And if there's some way of swaying that cost or whatever, you know, take into consideration by the director, um, I think that's fine. I'm not a, not opposed to it as it's written. There's only a couple of air corrections I'd like to see, but as far as this issue, I'm fine. I, I would say a lot of it has to depend on reasonable enforcement. I mean, the traffic code is the same way. How many of us actually obey the law to the letter every time we drive? We never drive 26 down the third. Mm -hmm. There is, at some point, you rely on reasonable interpretation by the people doing the court work. And I don't think we have the staff to go out and issue all the nitpicky violations that people are afraid of might. Uh, again, probably every property in the city has some violations. So we have to rely to some extent on, on reasonable enforcement. Well, and a lot of our enforcement comes yeah, we're primarily just like driven by own death and someone goes up and goes, oh yeah, they are not, they're not compliant. Well, that's and, a, and I sorry. understand. And I just, it was just a concern I had and I just wanted to, uh, to hear some debate on it. And yeah. I think well, I, I'm satisfied with what I've heard. Okay, well, most court codes are, you know, most enforcement ordinances are enforced on a complaint made basis. Even the city of Seattle, I mean, they had two code enforcement officers that did shoreline enforcement for the whole city. And um, they just waited for the complaints to come in, and then there's still a discretionary process at the city level to decide whether or not it's something that you know needs to be done. So, and nobody has to file an appeal. Yeah. I'm going to nitpick a little bit just about some of the wording structure. Um, we brought it up last week, but we talked about calendar days, business days. Okay. Well, start with the. 20.82.009. Yeah, um, page 12. Yeah, here's the bottom of page 12. Um, 1A, it talks about um, at the bottom where it says uh, within one week of after receiving the deal. Um, I'm basically nitpicking on top of the page on page 9. 20.82, 109, page 12, A, A paragraph dash 1. The bottom last sentence says, uh, shall be made and scheduled a hearing within one week after receiving the appeal. I'm just, what I'm nitpicking on is consistency across. When we're talking calendar days, when we're talking calendar days across the board. Business day, we got business day. But here we got one week, and farther down we got section B, capital B. Uh, at the beginning we say ten calendar days, and then at the bottom the last sentence we say five business days. So to me it's just it's semantic, but it's clarity, you know, consistency of the That's kind of what I do with the work. <laughs> 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 okay.
mean, why can make those changes and then there was another uh, concern about how silly a bill could be filed? But yeah, why do you mean, want it 15 to what? I would like to see it 15 business days just from the perspective that we got small holiday weekends or something. We want people to be able to, to have time to consult with uh, an expert or an attorney or something. Sometimes it takes a week to 10 days just to get into something about <coughs>